uh, and we've grown. This is the first year we had a national call for plays. We had over 100 plays submitted. We uh, utilized a peer review process, which means that each of the playwrights that participated not only sent in their work, but then read and evaluated each other's plays, um, which makes the process uh, theirs, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so the results were we had 28 semifinalists who were read in um, Ithaca, Santa Barbara, Ithaca, New York with um, Acting Out New York. We had Kate Bergstrom who's here who handled our reading in Santa Barbara, she's fabulous. And we also had a reading in Sedona, Arizona with Red Earth Theater Company and then, um, and then a reading in Waco which I coordinated with the Waco Civic Theater. Um, we're hoping to grow. If you like what you see, please visit the website. It's uh, littleblackdressinc.org and find out how you can get involved as a playwright, as a producer, as just a fan. We love you all. Um, last, things, last things to do. Oh, I want to thank the LATC. We are at the Los Angeles Theater Center, which is a fabulous downtown venue. <laughs> Not only does the LATC do a lot of really awesome work, they also produce a lot of female playwrights, which we really like, so thank you. Um, also want to give a shout out to the Los Angeles Female Playwrights Initiative, which has been a very big supporter, so thank you. And if you're at home and you want to tweet along, we're going to be tweeting at L Black Dress Inc. You can find us there. It's going to be scrolling across the, across the screen. I'm going to stop talking so we can watch these fabulous plays. Thank you so much, and uh, here we go. Act One, Seeds of Rebellion, written by Kay Coyle. Dark stage, sounds of the tapping of a typewriter. The tapping stops and lights up on three characters in tableau. Josie, female dressed in a poodle skirt, sips a milkshake. Owen, male, dressed as a 1950s juvenile delinquent, leans against the wall. <laughs> Older character, wipes down an imagined counter as if it's a bar top. Is she gone? Sounds like it. Thank God. The characters look relieved and come alive. I don't know which one's stiffer, this skirt or this plot. I like this story. Me too! She's off to a cracking good start this time. You can't literally see the headlights of literary mediocrity barreling towards us? Oh, all I see is she's writing another play and we get to be the stars. Yeah, another <laughs> ten minute play. What do you, what do you got against ten minute plays? Uh, gee, I don't know. Main character dressed in a poodle skirt sips a milkshake? First of all, my name isn't main character. <laughs> it's not? And do you really want to spend ten minutes wiping down that bar? Can we at least get a real set? Uh, hang on a minute, miss. It might not be that bad. Yeah, it, it, it's only page two, and uh, lots of writers don't fill in the names till later. No, not this writer. <laughs> she builds you up only to slice you up at the knees. And if you make it to the end, do you think there's any character development? What can anyone possibly learn about me in ten minutes? Calm down. It's only the first draft. <laughs> the, the, young man, the young man's right. You could find yourself with a name yet. That's not the point. The point is, I was born with a name. I mean, what about you? Older character. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just grateful to be back. Not, not many folks out there want to hear the story about an 80-year-old war horse. <laughs> you are 80? An 80-year-old widower. Been plugging away for the last four years in different drafts. A few months back, I almost made it through a suspense piece. Oh, hey, I, I was a superhero once. You don't say! I, I've got it! I have a plan. Josie produces a black beret, places one on her head and hands out berets while talking. We are more than just characters. We have motivations, thoughts, fears, loves, and we need to show her. I mean, who are you? Really, do you even know? I, 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 um, <clears throat> I like to dance, and, um, and I like mid-century modern furniture, and I, uh, I want to travel to Tibet and hunt the Yeti. Uh, yeah, uh-huh, that's me, uh-huh. He puts on this beret. <laughs> and 
and my name is Owen. <laughs> Welcome to the family. Oh. Pauline was a fan of the mid-century modern. Who well, was Pauline your wife? Yeah. Back then, it was just called Danish modern. The sofas, the tables, great color, shapely legs. <laughs> Pauline, not the table. So <laughs> she had this infectious laugh and mon sourire qui illumine his cell. I was stationed outside Paris during the war, picked up a little bit of the language. I apprenticed with a pastry chef, too. You were in the war? Oh, yeah. I even kicked around the city for a couple of years after the liberation. That's when I met Pauline. Pauline. No, no, no. An older character places the beret on his head with purpose. Infantryman, husband, pastry chef, Wilfred Forbes. Josie and Owen offer crisp salutes. Wilfred returns it. So, Miss Revolution, you care to share your grand plan? It's simple yet effective. At the end of it, you are going to hunt the Yeti, and you, you are going to make the best darn pan au chocolat you've ever tasted. Right. And if I can't beat Josie in a full length play, fine. But I'm making it to the second draft if it kills me. But how do you know <laughs> she's going to cut us? It's, it's, she's only uh, five pages in. Trust me, she always does this. But I know the warning signs. You don't have anything to worry about. She's given you a name. When she wants to get rid of you, first, you lose your name. Then your part gets smaller. Smaller? How small? Saying less and less until BAM! You're out of there! And the scariest part, she doesn't even need a pen. She can just think you out. This time might be different. <laughs> what makes you think today is any different from his suspense play or when you were a superhero? She, she could change. Older character slowly rises and wanders away. Wait, uh, wait, Mr. Uh, uh, whoa, whoa, uh, Mr. Mr. Wait, come back! Older character disappears off stage. <laughs> Where's he going? Now, do you believe me? Oh boy, what's gonna happen to us? Well, where am I gonna go? I, I don't know how to do anything else. Oh my god, what if she writes something set in a forest? What about my seasonal allergies? What? I'm a dead man! Josie slaps him. Ow! <laughs> Join me in the resistance! Resistance how? Together, that's how we're a team. We're on paper! Listen! <laughs> Listen! She writes go left, you go right. She says upstage, you go down. Got it? <laughs> Look, if you could play any character in the world, I bet you it wouldn't be some greaser kid, huh? Well, I guess not. Sound of approaching footsteps. <laughs> Now's your chance. Follow your dream. Act now or live forever with regret. What if it doesn't work? Oh, here she comes. Sound of the door opening, footsteps coming closer. Man, your post, and remember! Owen nods solemnly as they go back to Tableau, wearing berets with fists raised in the air in a defiant salute. <laughs> the end. <laughs> A living room that took great taste and equally great thought to make it as perfect as any living room can be. A sofa dominates. It faces a flat screen TV whose volume is turned down. A door stage left leads to the outside. An open door on the opposite side leads to other rooms. At rise, the room is empty. In the kitchen, come on in. Naomi enters, carrying a shopping bag. Sorry, I'm late. There was an accident, something involving a motorcycle. Looked awful. They were loading him onto a stretcher right as I drove past. I tried not to slow down, you know, out of respect. God, his poor mother. People ride motorcycles to save money and then to say yes, and then they get killed. It's so unfair. Tamara enters carrying small plates of food she places on the coffee table. They also ride between cars, which is a fucking death wish. <laughs> Tell me you brought wine. <laughs> Shit! Oh, don't. I was rushing. Have we ever watched election returns without it? Seriously, I, I am not myself lately. I'm all over the place, and you're like 
glowing. Did you get a peel? Oh, I'm so glad you're back. <laughs> Canvassing without you was a nightmare. They paired me with a former libertarian. She kept preaching about taxes. I found myself pointing out potholes and asking if they fixed themselves. Don't ever leave me during the last two weeks of an election again. <laughs> the West Coast numbers are coming in. Okay, it's official. I'm hitting the hard liquor. Tamara exits in the other room. <laughs> Naomi suddenly dives for the food, shoveling great fistfuls into her mouth. So, trip was amazing. Oh my god, Greece is paradise. Mm, I couldn't stop eating. The fruits, like un and unlike anything you have ever experienced, figs, like candy, better than candy, and tomatoes, not all shiny and perfect, but real, mm, delicious. <laughs> Until you get E. coli. <laughs> and the people, so warm and welcoming. And do they work? Of course they work, <laughs> a lot. They're just not obsessed with it. Americans always think they're the only people. Oh, look at those numbers. Oh, they're even better than predicted. Oh my god, I'm so happy you're back. <coughs> Tom, why aren't you drinking? Well, Still jet lagged? A little. Hey, I brought something back for you. She takes a wrapped gift from her shopping bag, hands it to Tamara. Stop it. Tamara rips it open. It's an evil eye pendant. An evil eye. Loving it. Really? You like it? Of course. It's blown glass, but it's not polite. Oh, thanks, sweetness. <laughs> you can put it in your car. Oh, please. I'm the least superstitious person on the planet. Oh, oh, look at that margin. Not one of the pundits predicted that. <laughs> it's not in your car, or at least put it in your bedroom. What the fuck for? <laughs> I don't know. To create good energy? Oh, speaking of, any vacation sex? Well, yes, but there's something I also want to There was vacation sex, and I'm only hearing about it now? It was such a small part of the experience. Between the beaches and the fruit, it ranked way up down. We are late, everybody. <laughs> Nature dry spell. Who was he? Nikos. They're all Nikos there, right? <laughs> I want details. Or I can't make you a drink. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Who was he? Is he? Was he? <laughs> a guy. I met him at one of those... Beachside tavernas they have everywhere. But that's not really what I wanted to tell you. Beach? But if the beach is rocky there, that can't be comfortable. I didn't. We didn't do it on the beach. She goes for more food. <laughs> Eat much? I'm pregnant. Sorry? Well, I, I had to tell you in person. The truth is, I probably shouldn't be telling anybody this early, but how do you not tell your best friend something this monumental? That's just it, crazy. It is, right? It's really it's kind crazy. of a miracle. Exactly. So, how do you tell Nikos? Send a note via carrier pigeon to his remote island? Oh, it's, uh... Um, sure, right? When you sound sure, but if it's early... I'm sure. How? Are you okay? I, I, I know it's totally out of the field. I guess I'm having a hard time gauging your reaction. Uh -huh. I'm just shocked. In a good way. You sure? Yes! It's a miracle! It is, right? Oh, I knew the second after it happened. I can't explain it. I had this wave of dizziness right after. A tsunami, really. A tsunami. A good tsunami. A clearing out of the old to make way for the new. Then the next day, I felt this intense happiness, and I've felt it every day since. I can't describe it any other way than to use words I know you loathe. Glee. Ecstasy. Bliss. <laughs> <laughs> but then who isn't happy after they get laid? <laughs> Look at Navarra. Those assholes don't have a clue what's good for them. They'd rather elect a king than allow abortion. Look. I'm 40-something. I didn't think it was possible anymore. It's really kind of a miracle, yeah, you said that. Isn't it a miracle if you actually want a baby? I do want a baby. I didn't think I did, but now I do. See? Okay, I'm a little worried you're hating me right now, and I'm not entirely sure why, so do me a favor and say something. Wasn't it just last week we were making fun of the breeders with their 
baby hammocks and our high octane strollers. How they suddenly get religion, even though it's been scientifically proven that if you have unprotected sex, there's a good chance you're going to get knocked up. Like I said, it's weird and almost impossible to explain. No. I mean, look, congratulations. That state is filled with fucking idiots. Apparently, our canvassing did do a fucking thing. Mm, it did. It created a certain energy that creates, causes change. Even if you can't see it, I need a read though. I know I never said anything about wanting a baby. I seriously had no idea and I did until now. Like you said, we, we laugh at those people. Rebecca Gorman, who committed high crimes to make Phi Beta Kappa only to get married and breed like a prized spaniel. I'm not like them. You have to believe me. The thing is, T. It feels right more than anything ever has in my life. Oh, Christ, there's a huge part of the story I haven't told you. I wish you'd come back. I know you hate the word, but it felt like destiny. Like destiny was deciding for me, and I was just going along, and it was so freeing to not have to take everything upon myself for once. If it means anything, I think Nevada won't really make a big difference, you know, countrywide. We did good work there, and we'll continue to do it, even if I have to walk around in 100 degree heat with a baby strapped to I me. am really scraping the bottle in the barrel drinking this shit. <laughs> but I have to say, it's doing the trick. <laughs> Nevada. Right? I mean, it practically doesn't exist. <laughs> so, when's the wedding? I mean, since you're joining the ranks, there's going to be a fancy wedding in the near future, right? Keller lilies and Vera Lang? Oh, God, no. No, wedding. Just, that's what I want to do. No lavish ceremony of Nikos' remote Greek isle? It's not, well, it's not his. What I miss here? Nikos isn't, he's not the father of the baby. Where did you go on vacation again? To a med school in 1975? You know, you remember I told you about my ex-boyfriend, Steve? You fucked him when you went through New York. Well, it wasn't exactly true. God, you sure erased that dry spell? What, did, did you meet him during your layover and do it in the airport bathroom? Tamara! I'm just asking, because that would deserve a medical of some sort. Seriously. We met for lunch. In Brooklyn. I hadn't seen the guy since 1990, so it was weird. No, not weird. Fine. Like nothing had happened in 20 something years, or that a million things happened and we needed days to talk about it. Next thing you know, we were listening to a band in the park, and, and it was crowded, but there were all these people just you know, enjoying the music and the glorious New York day. So when we got pushed together, it sort of made sense. He put his arm around my waist and then... So damn groovy. And then... Please don't make fun of me. This is hard enough. Oh, please. It is. You're sitting there looking at me like... Like what? Like I'm not sure who you are anymore? I'm the same person. You have to believe me. We were two reasonably attractive, highly intelligent women opting out of sippy cups and designer diaper bags. We were starting a trend, and you don't fuck with a trend. <laughs> In a minute, you're going to have a baby shower. And I'll glance across the room and see you looking so comfortable fitting right in. I'll be the freak. Me. In my own home. Because, of course, I'll be the one throwing it. So I'll spend a lot of time in the kitchen pretending the food needs tons of attention. And I'll drink a lot. Look, I... I need you. Sure, my mother can come for a few months, but she's not... I mean, I don't have anyone. Except you. You know, not everything happens because you research the hell out of it and then get a great deal on Christ-like. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck does 
does that mean I'm drunk? Some things just <laughs> happen on their own. And you go with it because you know you're never going to get the chance to take on something so much bigger than yourself again. And besides, if the decision had been left to you, you might not have made it. You know, I don't buy any of that pop spirituality. That's my point, T. What is? What is your point? Life. Moving with it. Accepting it. Accepting people. But it's not just me. There, there's a whole lot of change going on out there. And you're fighting against it. The yoga retreat. You acted like I was joining a cult. It felt like you were. <laughs> Didn't they call it a weekend with the goddess within? This is happening, T. I need you to catch up. I need you, period. What, like a co-parent? No, dumbass, like a friend. <laughs> <laughs> and what if I don't want to? I hate that fucking world. That's not the point. Everyone's gonna think we're lesbians. Yeah, you know, whatever. You're really going to do this, aren't you? I am. So what do you say? Holy hell, look at this. It's too close to call. Lights dim, end of play. standing in a podium. There is ambient noise of many people in the room shifting in their seats. There is a very excited atmosphere. First of all, I want to thank you all for coming to the first meeting of Ovo Farmers Emerging Network. <laughs> Today is an auspicious day. We will band together as farmers and distributors to grow and sell only female-centric fruits and vegetables. <laughs> Hence, OFO. OVO farmers like the egg. But without eggs, we, we won't grow eggs. We are vegans. <laughs> Let me back up. My co-founder and partner, Kate Meehan, and I, <laughs> decided to start this organization after looking at our plates one afternoon at lunch. What did we see? Cucumbers, braised squash, carrots, Italian eggplant. <laughs> and what did we think? Why are we eating all of this phallocentric food? Think of it, people. How many times does the farmer's man's penis have to be shoved into our face before we wake up? <laughs> the time has come to take back the field from the male farmer with his string beans and his corn stalks and his celery. <laughs> we started the OFEM movement to provide feminists and feminist sympathizers everywhere with a source of food they can truly enjoy, that they can consume in small, ladylike bites without feeling the male-centric food industry is literally shoving its penis down our throats. <laughs> we will grow only, are you ready for this? Round, vaguely egg-shaped produce. <laughs> Think of it, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, non-GMO, organic, pleasantly plump edibles, <laughs> cherries, <laughs> potatoes, <laughs> pumpkins, <laughs> bell peppers, and of course, apples. <laughs> apples will the, be the symbol of our movement as we take back the garden, take back the farmer's markets, and overthrow the tyranny of the roadside fruit stand. <laughs> we will offer gorgeous, plump tomatoes, heirloom tomatoes, peaches in season, 
garlic with its offending stem. Cut off! <laughs> I'm gonna like that. <laughs> Roundish, delectable lettuces in all colors and textures with all their lovely peaks and valleys. <laughs> Who knows the benefits of eating an OFM diet? Maybe researchers in the future will discover a lessening of aggression in males and females, investing in this way of life, an increase in empathy, and neighbors will stop shouting at neighbors, road rage will decrease, speeding, oh, well that might become a thing of the past. <laughs> Sisters, Ovo farmers and farming, mark my words, may become the new way of life for the masses. But it starts here. Take a stand with me. Say no to sugar snap peas and yes to gourds. <laughs> no to corn and yes to watermelon. Hell no to zucchini and yes. She said she would. She's gone. She left an instruction. For what? Plants. She left instructions. They're not dead. I've been watering. <laughs> Why? It's in the instructions. <laughs> what if? What? Never mind. Look, I've been transplanting. You did that? I dug it up, put it in the pot. <laughs> you? How? Internet. <laughs> layer of dirt, layer of mulch. Layer of dirt. Here, I'll show you. Two dumps the flower pot onto the stage. Ah, you're killing it! I'll, I'll repot it! See? Dirt, mulch, dirt. But it's all mixed up together now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that might not be good. <laughs> uh, uh, another? Yeah. Another? Sure. <laughs> As three and two finish off their beers, one goes to the cooler, pulls out three long necks, pops them open, and passes them out. Thanks. Thanks. 
Chu takes a drink and puts the beer aside so he can gather up the dirt with his hands as he attempts to repot the flour. Hey, did, uh, did you pot this one? First one I did. Uh, the soil is dry. Dry? Needs water. I'll get the watering can. Two takes a drink of beer, puts it down, changes his mind, picks it up, and carries it off. I have some extra seeds if you want them. What? Seeds! I have seeds! Can you hold the pot up? <laughs> Two overwaters the pot. Uh, careful. Did I catch you? No, no, no. You're good. One puts the pot down. I have been growing my own food. Carrots, beans, cucumbers, peppers, all organic, no chemicals. I have extra seeds if you want them. No, thanks. I prefer flowers. You can't eat flowers. Some of them you can. Mm, they're impractical. They make me smile. You're not doing this because of her, are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> nice to have something you can watch grow. You can watch vegetables grow. Yeah, but one day you'll have to eat them. <laughs> that would be a sad day for me. They are plants. <laughs> they're my souls. Do they? I... How do you know? Because they just don't. You're drinking plants right now. Am I? Yes, yeast and hops grow out of the ground, my friend. Maybe I could grow grains. Uh, you might not have enough space back here. I could make my own beer. Ooh, there's an idea. Yes. Cheers to that. Whoa. <laughs> Three falls asleep and his beer bottle falls to the floor. <laughs> no. Let him sleep. He's had a hard time of it lately. What happened? It's a run of bad luck. It's good for him to get out of the house. <sighs> it's a nice day. No good being indoors today. <laughs> hey, do you think you could bring the TV out here? We could watch the game. Good idea! <laughs> That's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She'll come back. She will. She will. Happy chips? Yeah. Be right back. Thank you for not giving 
giving me away. I really shouldn't hang out, I'd hang out here under the circumstances, so you have a nice morning. Mariah. I'm Mariah. Um, nice to meet you, Mariah. Well, if you're going to pose as my daughter, or, oh Lord, my granddaughter, if that was the plan, right? Then you should at least know my name. Okay. Have a lovely day, Mariah. And uh, you can tell me yours, or should I guess? I'm Sadie, or Sadie K. S at K, Sadie at K. That's what I go by, my writer name. I mean, that's what we call it, writing, being a, a graph artist, whatever. Um, <laughs> okay, anyway, see you around Miss Mariah. You can fly, you know. It would save you a lot of time and, and keep you from having all those visits to the detention center. Look, I'm not a criminal, Mariah. I'm an artist, an activist. And my art is not always appreciated by the establishment. So it's I not I, your art they have trouble with. It's your canvases. <laughs> <laughs> A public property. I'm part of the public, right? What I do is for the public. She sees someone coming and quickly sits back down next to Mariah. <laughs> Mariah looks off in the direction Sadie was responding to. If you could just remember how to fly. You can avoid all this drama. If I could remember how to fly. That's right. Sadie sees the sketch pad. Hey, are you drawing? Can I see? Sadie gently reaches for the pad. Mariah allows her to take it. She pages through it. This yours? You're an artist too. Very cool. Well, I draw. My goal is to make art. And I'm practicing. I'm always practicing. You can call yourself an artist. That's the difference between our generations of black women. The claiming of the things, the confidence and the claiming. Humility serves no one. Well, I'm the same age as Oprah. And 10 years older than the First Lady of the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, my generation is doing just fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just fine. It's you that has forgotten how to fly. Yeah, you keep saying that, and I'm thinking she has dementia or early onset Alzheimer's or something. Oh, she got some. Sadie continues to look at the drawings. You're into birds. That's cool. Your drawings are really beautiful. Seriously, gallery quality. I'm just not that kind of artist. I have something to say. My art is political. Make it beautiful. Make it personal. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. No, well, that's the personal part. Okay, let's just agree to disagree about this one. Gotta fly. Diego Rivera, uh, he was a political artist last century. Huge murals, whole walls and sides of buildings. Yeah, okay. Great artist, very prolific. Thousands of paintings in his life. In museums still all over the world. His political stuff is interesting and dated. Stalin turned out to be not such a great guy. And then there was Frida Kahlo, his wife. I know her. I know her stuff. Uh, Mexican or something, one eyebrow. Or something. <laughs> 200 paintings. That's it. Everything she did revealed what in her was desperate to fly. She flew. So you don't mean literally fly in the air like a bird. You mean to rise above or release your spirit or hope flows or something like that. Something like that. No. 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 Well, I tell you, if I could fly, it would make my job a whole hell of a lot easier. You ever hang upside down from a gutter with... Suddenly, Mariah holds up her hand for Sadie to be quiet and still. She points to something out in front of her. Mariah begins to sketch. Sadie sees something out in front of her, sits slowly next to Mariah, transfixed on the view. Whoa, where did he come from? 
He must be lost, huh? I never seen a bird like that around here. He comes every day. No way. Check him out. Mariah sketches. Sadie is transfixed by the bird. Oh no, where's he going? What do we do? Where'd he go? I don't know. Birds fly away, Sadie. They just always do. So that's why you're here so early, to see the birds. Hey, why don't you take a picture, a photo, and work from that? Seems like it'd be a whole lot easier than waiting. Well, I don't make pictures of birds. What I say, this is personal. Sadie looks at the sketch pad on Mariah's lap. Looks like a bird to me. Mariah hands Sadie her pad. Sadie looks through and studies one of the sketches. I wait, and I watch, and I listen. So many tiny sounds in the morning quiet. I see that bush right there. The one with the tiny bright green buds. And then I let that bush see me. Oh, you do it. Uh, look at that yellow tree right over there. See? Yeah. Really see? All of it. Penetrated with your sight. Mm -hmm. Now let it see you. <laughs> All of a sudden, that tree has a lot going on for it. Am I right? A lot of days I come here and I don't see anything. It all seems random and senseless and, boy, I'm pissed off. Yeah, I know about being pissed off. <laughs> Every so often, I have a split second of communion with, with this and, and with that. Today with you? Me? And I put what I can down here. My work is political, too. And I take my politics very personally. Sadie looks back down at the pad again. I get it. I can see it here. The waiting. The hoping. The moment of delight. That split second of connection. That it's gone. Lost. And the memory of when it was here, before it was lost. Which brings you back to home, yeah? That's it. Right here. And beyond. Same place. All at once. And it's gone. And you doubt it was ever there. Maybe you made it up. That's really depressing, Mariah. Like some bleak ass Russian poem. <laughs> it is, isn't it? <laughs> but when I feel that thing inside me, meaning something bigger beyond me, I, so very okay. Good moment. Yeah. It happens to me most very early in the morning, just after dawn. That's the magic time for me. I guess for you, it's in the dead of the night. Oh, I work at night because no one's watching, you know, to not get caught. Can't do what I do in broad daylight. Or maybe the moon inspires you. Why not get still with her and see? Mariah sees a cop coming. Oh, I think your friend is back. Yeah, I don't care. Um, so you come here every morning right here? Well, the birds and I have an agreement. No way. <laughs> Rainy days, we work on other things. <laughs> and your family doesn't mind? Nothing. Oh. I had a son, but he's gone now. I'm sorry. Me too. The cop enters. Oh, pay him no mind. Now, listen, how can something be beyond me and inside me at the same time? I don't know, but I'm working on it. The cop sees clothing in the garbage can and picks it up and looks it over. And now that you don't give a hoot about that, maybe because you're working on it too. Maybe I can join you, you know, some mornings. You can come and perch here any time with the bird. Mm -hmm. Now that you can fly. Mm -hmm. Hey you, over there, I want to talk to you. 
Sadie sees something out in front of her and powerfully holds up her hand. She points in front of her. Oh my, right there. Mariah starts to sketch. I see. Oh, where did he come from? <laughs> they all look at the bird. Lights, end of play. <laughs> Fancy Tomatoes, written by Tiffany Anton. An overturned picnic table protects two gents, the first wearing a hollowed-out watermelon as a helmet, the second clutching a small wooden box. They cower as strawberries, apples, and a squash fly at them from a distance. Tiny is impeccable. I, I couldn't have chosen a more dreadful moment to the second. You never what? specified. No, I mean, really. The worst. I, I, I really think that, I, I mean, I have no part in things, really. This can't be good for a man. You, you want to make a run for it? You go ahead. A splat <laughs> as a cantaloupe lands deathly near. Not the cantaloupe. Not the cantaloupe! Janine, <laughs> a woman quite scorned, comes on carrying more ammunition. You really threw the pooch this time, George. You think I'm being discriminating? I hate all your precious melons. The berries, every inch of that preposterous promise. I'm going to fetch the chainsaw and take down your apple trees next. You wouldn't. You're a terrible husband. I most certainly am not. Splash! <laughs> Janine, let's just talk for the love of God. Don't you try to bring God into this. It, 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 it's really a lover's spec. It's very domestic. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm just a, a, a really a passerby, really. I, mean, I shouldn't even be, I mean, I mean, I, I'd like to be allowed to leave. Please. Splash, splash, splash. Oh, don't you play dead with me, you sniveling little cut. You're just as bad showing up with all that money-sucking preposterousness. God, I hate you! Oh, what? <laughs> Feldman clutches his box protectively. They, they, they can sense distress. I never speak to them above a whisper at home. What do you think this will do to them? Splat! George licks some of the splatter from his lips. Oh my God, she's discovered the tomatoes. What? Really? Feldman peeks his head up, getting hit squarely with a red ripe tomato. Oh, <clears throat> George grabs him, inspecting the carnage. It's just a beefsteak. Uh, damn it! <laughs> Janine, you don't know what you're doing! Feldman wipes it from his face in horror, then fascination. <laughs> he takes a taste. Oh, don't I? Three years. Three years of scrimping and saving the vacation of a lifetime. Do you hear me? You promised all gone for a handful of... Of dry, crunchy... It's not all gone. Stop being so dramatic. And, and I told you that I'm going to pay it back. Dramatic, dramatic! The interest! A new barrage of fruits and vegetables splatter. Maybe you should try flattering her over insulting... Jenny! I watch you every day out here talking to your plants, whispering to the cucumbers, singing to the tomatoes. You spend more time doting on your garden than you ever have to my, my, my feminine fruits! Please, <laughs> don't you honey me? Do you know the last time I had an orgasm? Of course you don't! It was last night by myself in the bathtub. You could have been there! <laughs> Damn it, woman! You get out of my tomatoes! He gets hit with a torrent of fruity flesh. 
Feldman, meanwhile, has lifted a nibble of the fancy tomato. He smacks his lips in appreciation and wonder. It's, it's sweet. It's just, just the right texture of the walls. So thin, so, so delicate. It, it, you know, that's way too <laughs> delicate for a rainbow, but, but, but the sweetness. Followed by a, a tangy, like, a, like a, a tangy aftertaste, almost like a black. It's not at all like a rainbow. My God! Bill Evans scrambles. What, 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 what are you doing? I'm on to your game! What are you talking about? You're inviting me over, plying me with cash. You're crossbreeding! <laughs> You want my little muppets to be party to this debate? Oh, what? Feldman, stop smothering. I'll not have it. These little beauties have been pure and pristine for a hundred years, and I'll not have you claim Frankenstein with their spawn. He makes a run for it, or a crawl. He doesn't get too far. George lashes onto his foot, and Janine pelts his head. Ah, ah, there you are, you slime. You weasel, you money-grubbing gardener. Let me go! You don't understand! I do understand! It's an abomination! It's crossbreeding! An heirloom is an open pollinator! There's no reason that a rainbow can't live next to plum or otherwise... You're polluting the system! They're delicious! George Whistle Smells and winding up on top of him. Ah! I thought you were a purist! I'm a delicatessen! <laughs> Take that! You self-absorbed, green-obsessed, rain-collecting spendthrift! Janine, please, just listen to me! Let me go! Let me go! Let me go! You never think about anyone else. I thought when I married you that you were just focused. Now, I know that you suffer from an acute case of obsession. Let me go! 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 You think I don't wonder what it's like to be whispered at? Like one of your fancy tomatoes? See you caressing them, singing to them, practically making out with them when the moon is full and the rains just come. I love you! What? Let me go! Not right. I won't let you do it. I'm a good man. George begins stuffing tomato and fruit bits into Feldman's mouth in a bit to shut him up. I, I, I love you. I, I have always loved you. Just taste that. Maybe I do suffer from uh, uh, tunnel vision. Stop fighting me. But it's only because, because you make it so easy. Just let me do this. Oh and my God. Because you. You love me so right, because you, you, you are so amazing. You take care of everything that, that, that I forget to, I'm on the verge here, uh, to thank you for it. And you are such an amazing caregiver and housekeeper and, and, and breakfast maker that I, we're on the verge of a revolution here. I take it for granted that you are doing all these things for me, and I am sorry. I need you to keep Line. I need you to tell me that I've been in the garden for four hours and it's time to spend some time with you and your lady bits instead. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. That's a terrible apology. Well, I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to tell you how much I love you. More than your tomatoes? What? Oh, yes, of course. I want to go to Florence. <laughs> I want to go to Florence, even if it means you have to get a second job. Uh, um, what? You spent all of our money on plant seeds. It calls me down! No, Maria! Uh, they stare. <laughs> they squint. Janine weighs another tomato. Feldman gurgles. <laughs> and stops breathing. <laughs> uh, Feldman? Feldman? Pinches Feldman's nose and blows. Bits of tomato and strawberry go spraying out of the sides of his mouth. Janine knocks him out of the way. You've got to fish all that crap out of there. First, you're just going to blow it deeper into his lungs. Janine oh. sticks her fingers into his mouth, pulling out the mashed up fruits. Yes. Oh, you're, you're going to get that money back. But, 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 but. You're flying first class. J J Janine. And I want the window seat. Now blow. George takes another breath, leans down, pinches, and blows. And we're staying at bed and breakfast. I want the full experience. We need to call the paramedics. Feldman! She slaps him! Oh! Feldman! 
then. Damn it. I'm not spending spring break in jail. Wake up. Honey. Blow. Okay. George blows again. Miraculously, Feldman coughs. Oh. Oh. Freeze rolls over and opens his eyes. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you're back. I saw him. Feldman? There was light. Bright light. It was everywhere. <laughs> I died! I know it! You brought me back! He grabs George tightly, he looks him fiercely in the eye. There's no tomatoes in heaven, George. <laughs> Feldman picks up his little brown seed box, cradling it close to his chest. Where do you go? Where do you go when your time is <laughs> I, I, I want to eat all the pizza and pasta in Italy that I can without feeling guilty about it, okay? Yeah, are you all right? I want to see my home and travel to Venice. I want to ride in a gondola while you feed me gelato and tear me soup. It's all right. Italy will be my slice of George looks at his wife, looks, his, looks at his tomatoes, and finally looks to Feldman. But Feldman, I, uh... We must make your hybrids. Well, Janine is kind of having a meltdown. He, what, 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 what did you say? What did you mean? What Feldman mean? puts a chair in his pocket, tears it to shreds. Janine collects them joyously. There are more important things in this world than money, George. I see it now, stretching out before me like a never-ending farmer's market. Time is precious, too precious to waste on petty grievances. Me and the seeds are in this for the glory, the fame, the joy, the vacation, the end. <laughs>
All right, let's carve it up. I mean, 
you could disintegrate while trying. There's so many loopholes. Everyone can't make it. That's true. But at least if you go down, you go down trying. Uh, I don't want to disintegrate. Spurn 2 dons a superhero cape and a pair of goggles. He practices his best superhero takeoff poses. <laughs> some of us make it, some of us don't. That's the lay of the land, and you better get with it. Ooh, this land has been plowed. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. It sounds like bullshit to me. <laughs> well, life is full of shit, Jelly Bean, and it doesn't matter where it comes from. A bright light, light. <sighs> Sweet over. It's time to end and flow out of here. Whoa, 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 yo, man, I, I don't trust this, this over chick. Uh, well, no, whatever you do, don't go towards the light. Sperm two looks all around one final time. That always gonna trap you. Oh, jeez. Whoa, get a load of him. <laughs> She's not gonna dig that outfit, man. <laughs> that superhero look is so yesterday. <laughs> At least you didn't do tights. That would have been a total disaster. Oh! Sperm one hits the egg. Oh, shit. It's too late. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> Between them is a small table. Edward, a man approaching 80, enters with a small cardboard box. He's wearing a clean polo shirt, khakis, and tennis shoes. Not only is he in great physical shape, not a hair is out of place. He places the box on top of the small table, and from it he draws a small urn. He takes it to the edge of the balcony. He sighs and stares at the ocean. He then opens the urn and turns it upside down, scattering what amounts to a very few ashes into the sand and sea below. That's the last of you, as promised, off the balcony of the new condo and into the ocean. Damn. Stiff upper lip, blinking back tears. He puts the urn on a small table and sits heavily in one of the chairs. Skip, a man on the other side of 60, enters wearing a Hawaiian shirt, shorts, flip-flops, and sunglasses on his head. He jauntily carries an open cardboard box marked photos. Permission to come aboard! Beg your pardon? Oh, oh, oh sorry. Didn't mean you make your shout mayday. <laughs> Ensign Skip Blinjetsky, retired. And you're downstairs, ain't you? Yeah. Oh. Skip puts the box down. So the old fouled anchor sticker on the rear windshield of your Mustang knew you had to be a Navy man too. Am I right or am I right? Skip <laughs> reads the label on the box. Edward Arlington Jones the third. Right. Edward immediately picks up the box and puts it where Skip can no longer examine. So what is it retired, Eddie? Edward. Oh, well, you can tell you weren't on the USS Kishwaukee. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't get yourself a nickname right away when you were a seaman. Well. Let's just say, the first night Leo Mordechai Plindietsky got his birth short sheet with shit in it, Skip was born. <laughs> what was your rank, sailor? Admiral. Sir! <laughs> Admiral, sir! Skip's knees are starting to shake. He hasn't held this pose in years. <laughs> Admiral, sir! My knees aren't what they used to be, sir! Aren't you gonna say Eddie's ensign? Oh, for God's sake, Eddie's ensign! Oh, whoa! Oh, thanks, Admiral. <laughs> Sir? Oh. Uh, please don't call me that. My name is Edward. Oh, that doesn't feel right. Skip. I have never asked, nor have I desired anyone to refer to me by my rank since I retired 20 years ago. Wow. Okay. Got it. And your ship was. I can't tell you that. Top secret? Nuclear Navy. I could tell you, but then, then I'd, I'd have, have to, to kill, kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Your secret's safe with me, Admiral uh, Sir uh, Edward. Now, if there's nothing else, I really need to. Edward gestures to the boxes. Skip turns and crosses to the door. Edward crosses to the box. Skip brought in, which is next to the earth. Edward stands frozen by the small table. 
If it's top secret, how come you have the foul anger sticker on the windshield of your Mustang? Leave me alone. But get out of here. I got it. Sorry, sorry of my life. I just can't. Can't <laughs> deal with me. I know. Neither can anyone else. Don't worry, it's okay, I'm used to it. It's not bad. Sooner or later, that's what they all say. The neighbors, the guy in the Kishwaukee, it's my mother. It's not <laughs> my mistake. Yes. 
the love of my life, was a handsome woman. The most handsome woman who ever drew breath. That's because her name was Milton. Milton, you understand? <laughs> Ensign? No, sir, I don't think I do, sir. The love of my life was a man, Ensign. A, a man. A, a man? Sir. A man, a man! There, I said it. I said it out loud, Milton. You didn't live to hear it! How can you not be alive to finally hear me tell the truth? Now hear this, Nebraska! Mrs. Edward Arlington Jones III, the most handsome woman in Omaha, president of the Ladies' Garden Society, lead alto of the Garden Gals Glee Club, is a man, was a man, and I will love him forever. Permission to speak, sir? No, Benson, permission to listen. Listen, yes, I am one of those Nancy boys the Navy was full of, the ones you hated and feared. One of those sailors for whom Don't Ask, Don't Tell forced a lifetime of secrets and lies. Until now, it's too late. It's too late. Sir, permission no, to No, leave. no, no, permission to stay. Stay and listen. You may think I'm less than you are every day I'm alive, but by God, I will outrank you until the day I die. Say yes, sir! Yes, sir! as two gay men in a condo by the seashore. That ain't in the neighbors looking at us like you're looking at me right now. Permission not to look you in the eye, sir. Permission not granted. I <laughs> <laughs> think our love was as foul as the fouled anchor. Unnatural? Well, it wasn't, Henson. You know, you know what Milton called it? Stop shaking and listen to me. It's my knees, sir! <laughs> you can keep him out of that damned organic garden of his. And, and, le and let me tell you something before I release you, Ensign, because I'm going to release you and you'll be free to say any goddamn thing you like to me before you run out that door in disgust. Milton, sun shining on that ridiculous straw hat he always wore in that crazy garden, he used to harvest the biggest zucchini in town and say, Edward, Edward, darling, they may not know it, but our love is as good as theirs. It is certified organic. Certified organic. All right, that's an Eddie. Oh, whoa. Oh. Go on, say it, Skip. Permission to speak frankly, sir? As frankly as I've been speaking to you. Sailor to sailor? Man to man? Man to man. I'd really like... I'd really like to... Get it out, Skip. Say it. I'd really like to take a ride in that Mustang. What? <laughs> <laughs> Top down. Top down? With you. With me? No one ever made this. No one ever made me stay with them before. That was, was better than the Navy. That, that was nice. That was, wasn't it? Yeah. Hey, let's drive down to the Paradise Bar in Long Beach. That old gay dive bar is still there? Oh, last time I checked. <laughs> and you want to take me? No! Not, not take you there for me. I want to take you there for you. See, if there's anyone there who, well, you know, puts the life back in the old lighthouse. <laughs> I'm a one-man man, Skip. Maybe. But from what I understand, friends get friends late, sir. And whether it's with a gal or with a guy, I think, I think you need to get late, sir. I don't know about that, but if we're going to be friends, you need to call me Edward. Edward. Can I... Milton's <laughs> <laughs> Mustang. Yes. As a mate. Edward takes the keys out of his pocket and hands them to Skip. It's just a drive, Edward. <laughs> it's not like it's. What was that again? Certified organic. Yeah. 
Certified organic. Certified organic, sir. <laughs> Edward and Skip go to the door and all. End of play. <laughs> Jane stands next to a tall pedestal table in a crowded Starbucks-like coffee spot. She's drinking from a covered paper cup. We hear business bustle around her along with traffic and street noises in the back. The woman looks out front through a window onto the street. A lot's going on. She checks her phone. Someone's late. No one's called. No surprise. Lynn enters with the cup. Not hampered by the people around her, she moves directly to the table. No word? Nothing? No, but she does this all the time. Not calling? She mostly calls, but she's always late, and there's always a fabulous excuse. She had someone on a date last night, so maybe it'll be extra fabulous this time. <laughs> What's a somewhat date? Movies with a friend. A man, but just a friend. So that's not a date at all? <laughs> with her, you never know. <laughs> I don't understand. Rebecca answers. <laughs> she moves with a disturbing awareness of the close proximity of people around her and the chaos outside. Hey, you. Hey. I was right, wasn't I? Hot city in the night. Uh, well, you look terrible. Nice to see you, too. You look like a woman with a tale to tell. No, I'm serious. You really do look. Be a dog get or something, would you? Like what? To drink? That'd be great. Thanks. Uh, what should I? Get her what I'm having. Tell them it's for me. But it's not for. You know what? It's okay. And see if they have any croissants left. Uh, the chocolate ones. If not chocolate, berry, or something. But not cheese. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks. I sometimes think she lives on her own planet. I really do. So. Given your questionable appearance, I'm especially looking forward to the story behind your 45-minute delay. I know. I'm sorry. And it's not No, no, no. Hang on for just a bit. Our guileless friend has not apparently been privy to even one of your extraordinary excuses. What bizarre mishaps or accounts of barely missed buses do we have in store this time? <laughs> yeah, I wish. And oh, I just noticed. You wore that last night all wet. You didn't even go home to change you fast woman, you. I. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't start yet. It's never as good the second time. Huh. How about the third time? I don't know. I never quite got the charm thing. But that's just me. I'm jaded. <laughs> right. <laughs> no chocolate croissants. And no berry? No. So no croissants? No. Not even cheese. Do this, 
but I'd settle for a biscotti if it comes down to the <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it was late, so we thought we'd take a bus home. My friend and I. Right. There weren't a lot of people around. We didn't give it a second thought. No. And we didn't notice until we got on what kind of bus it was. What kind of was it? <laughs> well, yes. A bus with curtains. A what? In the back, for privacy. They're very popular now because who wants a public rape? Rape is something you do in the privacy of your home with the drapes drawn or in the occasional alley, shuttered storefronts, office cubicles, bathroom stalls. That's always a go-to. Waking up after a party, having no idea what happened until you watch the videos. I don't understand. <laughs> don't tell me you haven't seen the buses. Rape buses. Oh. Handy dandy buses drawn with curtains built for rape. What? Really? No, but I think the city prides itself on adaptive reuse. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to tell what they are, especially at night. We didn't notice the curtains or the men in the back until we were already moving, and... Oh, that's a hard road. Gang rape and traffic. Gang rape? How many of them were there? I don't... At least five. My friend tried to protect me. Oh, that must have pissed them off. How is he? How is he? You have no idea what an angry rapist is capable of. I bet they roughed him up something terrible. How are you? I'm... She's fine. Late, but fine. And to be honest, on the excuse meter... She was raped for the third time this year. You're talking like that's some sort of a record. And my five men, all five? She doesn't get extra credit for that. When I was in my 20s, it was like every month I couldn't keep track. She'll get over it. We all do. How? What choice do we have? I mean, look around you. Yeah, this place is full of rapists. Rapists at the counter, rapists drinking coffee, rapists with baked goods, goddammit. <laughs> the street is teeming with them. Oh, look, there's a couple I recognize now. <laughs> I mean, stop acting like you've never been raped. I haven't. What? I've never been raped. Never. Ever. ever. You're serious? Yeah. Oh my god. I would have never guessed. Man, you are in another world. You've never been raped. Not once. How could that be? I don't know. <laughs> But you have had sex. Of course. <laughs> Consensual <laughs> sex. That's still possible. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to say it, sweetheart, but you are due. Why am I due? What's it like? I don't even remember. And at this age, the first time is just going to be all the much harder for you. You shouldn't have put it off that long. That's crazy. Real sex that you want to have. Put it off? What are you talking about? Oh, race one of those things. You just have to get out of the way. It's easier. But, but why should it be easier? Why should it even happen? Look at her for the third time this year. She doesn't look like she's had it easy. She looks like she's had, it, had enough, more than enough. She looks like she's broken. I feel broken. I am broken. There are pieces of me all over the city, behind curtains and in dark corners, and on the street in broad daylight, and in my own bed, in my own home. Pieces I don't even recognize. I'm not even sure they're still a part of me. I keep moving, and there's less and less of me this year, each year. Here. We'll drink up. That's just the way it is. But why? Why? What if it didn't have to be that way? What if we lived someplace where rape wasn't the way it is? In your alternate universe where rape apparently doesn't exist? Or if it does, as long as it does, it should never be easy. Men should never be raised to think that, should not be raised to think that. There should never be an excuse for anyone. There's a siren. Can you imagine? Opening 
the curtains, take them to them down, so everyone sees, everyone knows, everyone has to. And getting on a bus to some place you actually want to be. What if? End of play.
wild oats in me. Catch a seed on the wind and stick it in. Stick your finger into the hot, wet earth and let it catch. Let it explode from me and climb like a bamboo shoot skywards and let it carry us until we see the curvature of the earth. Let it grow from me and into you. Because I need a season outside of my own head. Because I love you. Because I choose it. And that's good too. End of play. <laughs> the Environmentalists, written by Marla Dean. Time now, place, New York City, Upper East Side. Lights come up on Dorothy's old but luxurious apartment. It is empty. Footsteps and heavy breathing are heard as someone tries to unlock the door. There is frantic jiggling and hitting of the door. I can't get it to work! Damn it! Why is it the minute you put the key in the lock, you immediately go, got to go to the bathroom? Suddenly from out of nowhere, you have to pee so bad you think you're going to die. It's <laughs> always that way. So weird. Are you using the right key? No, of course I'm using the right key. But this is not helping, Louise. I'm dying here. <laughs> you wouldn't dare. Let me try. Stand back and give me some room. Fine. You think you can do it better? Be my guest. Open sesame. It's all in the wrist. Louise unlocks and opens the door. Dorothy rushes in, and Louise, on her walker, follows slowly. But both are wearing strange wigs. <laughs> Louise, a short blonde platinum, and Dorothy, a long bright red with bangs. <laughs> They're wearing matching unitards with a stylish jacket and boots. <clears throat> but they're torn, dirty, and both look like they've been through hell. Hurry! I think we were followed! Hurry up! A uh, thank you would be nice, and I'm moving as fast as these old bones will go. Where is everybody? Dorothy slams the door behind her and begins locking the door tight as Louise heads down the hall. Did you notice the dark blue sedan? I swear it followed us from the airport. I've never been so terrified in my life. I thought we'd never get here, and I told you we should not check our bags. No, 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 you said. Too much to carry. We can change when we get to the airport. And then we barely made the gate, and you lose our carry-on. My pills were in that carry-on. Damn it, Louise. I don't think I could ever travel with you again. Thank God it was only to Montana instead of to Paris. Dorothy examined herself in front of Fuller's Not too shabby. Louise, do you like me as a redhead? I think it works. For who? <laughs> <laughs> You're almost 70. You look great. I love the platinum blonde on you. Oh, you are such a liar. <laughs> you know what is cool about the walker? You don't have to sit down and pee. Really, uh, unless you're in a unitard, the thing you insisted we all wear, the men looked ridiculous. The word is stylish. Yeah, right. Looks like we made it with, what, ten minutes to spare. I thought the boys would beat us. I did too. Oh, the stress, the traffic. Do you realize I haven't missed an appointment with my therapist in five years? Do you think he believed me? You told him you were sick, right? Deathly ill. Of course he believed you. You're always deathly ill. <laughs> I resent that. You know how difficult my poor health has been for me, and I don't think there's anything wrong with keeping yourself monitored. Oh, that reminds me, I need to take my blood pressure ASAP. <laughs> Dorothy takes a cuff off an end table and begins taking her pressure. You've got to be kidding. You have a portable blood pressure taker? Technology today. Let's see. 123 over 70. Oh, looking good, but I don't know how after the last two days. Uh, since you're all fine and dandy, uh, why don't you fix us a drink and we can take a few deep breaths? You think you should? You already had two on the flight. Are you counting? When you have a few too many, you get a little loud, call attention to yourself, and under the circumstances, 
Well, I don't know what I'd do without you watching out for me and seriously wonder how I lived for 72 years without your help. <laughs> I have had it. Can you get these damn boots off of me? Dorothy struggles to get Louise's boots off. We were on every news channel at the airport. The fires are still burning. Get a better grip. You can do it, old girl. Pull harder. Well, you can help, you know. Even the driver was talking about it. The whole country thinks they've been attacked by radical Middle Eastern terrorists. The boots come off. There. Happy? Mmm, that and gone to heaven. Mm -hmm. I don't know how people wear these things on a daily basis. I've got to get out of these clothes. A nice long hot bath is what I need, but first, <laughs> the drinks. Don't that a girl. Into the kitchen. That a girl. Uh, you know, they had to put a spin on it, you know, Middle Eastern terrorists. How rich is that? Bozos, always pointing the finger in the easiest direction. They might think twice before they spit on old tree huggers. Ah, it was beautiful. Make it a stiff one. Could, could you believe the airport security? I haven't been touched that much in... Well, <laughs> Well, it was sort of fun. <laughs> the wheeze? Oh, I smell like a wet dog. You think I was carrying hand grenades by the way they grabbed my denture cream. <laughs> now there's a dangerous commodity. Beware of the old lady with the tube of denture cream. <laughs> Little did they know. Huh? Want to hear some irony? I think I have some stock in that oil corporation we just blew up. <laughs> Good. Money well spent. Dorothy enters with drinks. Both women sit. Ah, just what the doctor ordered. I'm not sure if traveling really suits me anymore. I used to adore new places. Montana? Not so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what time is it? Who cares? We made it back alive. Louise switches on the TV. <clears throat> Look, they're interviewing that young kid. Not a clue back. I still can't hardly believe we did it. Cactus. Horticulturists collecting cactus specimens. The perfect cover. Ha <laughs> ha! Look at them running around trying to save their precious oil. Ow! Oh, every joint in my body is on fire. You think the boys made it out? Maybe we should do something. I think we've done enough. They could be stranded somewhere, or maybe, maybe we should call the police. Uh, the highway patrol, the hospital, something. Are you crazy? We are under the code of silence. Remember the pact? Louise begins pacing, stomping her walker loudly. I could give a big damn about the pact. If anything happened to them... You are getting hysterical. I have a pill for that somewhere. You know we are in the silence mode. We can't contact them no matter what. We promise no calls. And the police? Are you kidding? We just blew up the largest oil field in the country. We might want to lay low for a few days. It's just like you to be in denial. <laughs> what, what are you talking about? You know exactly what I'm talking about. Thirty years you live with that cheating bastard and put on this act of the perfect married couple. That is denial. And you are still doing it. Our team could be laying out there bloody and beaten and all you can think about is your hot bath. I'm going to assume it is the tension of the moment <laughs> and your own age that has caused you to lose your mind. Any time anyone speaks the truth about you, they must be insane. <laughs> if you weren't in that walker, what? Bring it on. <laughs> you know, they call you the Black Widow behind your back. Who? Oh, what are you talking about? No, oh, I don't know. Four marriages, four dead husbands. What would you call it? That's a step. Oh, it seems like our recent stroke victim can hand it out but not take it. How does it reveal, huh? Louise and Dorothy are circling each other. 
I have spent the last four days listening to you complain about your non-existent illness and your stupid worries about your hair, your makeup, your joints, your blood sugar. My God, who gives a damn? And I've just about had enough of that stupid scarf, too. Louise brings the scarf that is wrapped around Martha's head and her wig comes off with it. My hair! What's the matter with you? Get out of my way! You are not going anywhere! Watch me! Dorothy blocks the door with her body. <laughs> Get out of my way, Dorothy! I'm not playing games! Call it an intervention, but I refuse to allow you to leave this room! You asked for it! Louise slams her walker down on Dorothy's foot. <laughs> Dorothy screams in agony, grabbing her foot and hopping. My button! <laughs> oh my god, you have crippled me! Oh, dear, dear, I think I'm going to faint. You've lost your mind and obviously do not know who you are dealing with. You have messed with the wrong person. If you think I'm just going to let you walk out of here now, you better guess again. Ah, uh, there's more of <laughs> where that came from, Tuss. No! Dorothy, enraged, grabs, grabs Louise's walker and throws it across the room. Ha! Louise jumps Dorothy and the women struggle awkwardly. Oh. It's a real cat fight. Oh. Between oh. really old cats. <laughs> Fill the air and Dorothy pulls off Louise's wig as the women bat. You look ridiculous. That color was all wrong for you. And we all know you have the hearts for the general. That is a desperately sick lie. Louise has Dorothy in a hammerlock as they struggle. At least try to keep your dress from flying over your head whenever he walks into the room. It's embarrassing for everyone. <laughs> Embarrassed? How about afraid? When I first saw your last first lit, talk about a dismal failure. Are you going for the clown look these days? Oh. That's it! The wrestling match escalates with screams <laughs> and ouches. <laughs> Until both women lie exhausted amidst overturned chairs and broken lamps. Oh. Look at this mess. And all because you wanted to break the pact. You overreacted. Perhaps, but a pact is a pact, and you did start it. They struggle to rise. <sighs> Environmental espionage is exhausting. <sighs> Dorothy finds and grabs her wig. You're not putting that back on. Uh, okay, if you want to look like a fool, who am I to stop you? Uh, <laughs> so now you want help, fat chats. <laughs> oh, look at the time. Maybe you're right. Boys are very late. Men, they had one thing to do. Detonate and come home. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they got picked up. They're old and in old is invisible. No one cares what three old dudes are doing in a beat-up van. <laughs> you're probably right. Want another drink? Is the sky blue? <laughs> the red hair is growing on me. <laughs> Straighten on your head and you might be passable. <laughs> I think we should focus on the tuna factory next. They kill dolphins, you know. Great idea. Make mine a dog. <laughs> <laughs>
have a third uh, savior here today, and that's Emily in the corner. So thank you. Water. I can't even. I'm so thankful. So um, uh, we've got some playwrights here. We have Jessica Abrams here. Jenny <laughs> Webb here. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody at home. Thank you all around in the LATC.